This is the Bates Bobcast, our weekly podcast that takes a look at the week that was in Bates Athletics. My name is Aaron Morse, and this week we're looking back on a clutch road win for the Bates field hockey team at Hamilton. Plus, Sergio Beltran is doing it all for Bates football, and women's tennis prevailed in their home opener. All that and more coming up on the Bates Bobcast. The Bates football team lost a heartbreaker on the road Saturday at Colby, falling 28-26 to to the Mules. The Bobcats had a chance to tie the game late, but their two-point conversion pass attempt got batted down. Despite the loss, head coach Matt Coyne was impressed with how his team played. Well, Coach, you know, we talked about last week how the defense had done such a great job limiting big plays, explosive plays. Colby was able to pull that off, um, both through the air and on the ground. When looking at tape, what do you see from this game? What can the defense kind of learn to make this just a blip and not something that becomes an issue? Yeah, no, I think it happens across the board. I mean, I think um, at times it just comes down to fundamentals, just tackling and knowing our assignments. Um, and, you know, they made some some good plays. But, you know, I know as we watch the tape and talk to our defense, they're not too pleased with how they played. Um, and that's, you know, understandable. Um, for the first three weeks, they, they were lights out and they really helped us offensively. Um, and it just seemed like it swung a little bit in that game. And, uh, you know, in a rivalry game under the lights like that, you know, uh, you got to play sound football all around. Offensively, though, the option looked really good, especially with Sergio Beltran, who we have as a wide receiver, of course. He was the lean receiver for the team last year. Unleashed is kind of more of a running back in this game. Tell us about Sergio, his second game back from injury, right? Yeah, Sergio did great. And I think it's a byproduct of us continuing to run the ball interior to open up the exterior. And within this offense, once you start to get it going on both um, you know, interior-wise and horizontally, it becomes very hard for the defense to defend. Um, and we saw that, you know, with Colby, they really struggled to find um, sort of the recipe to stop our, our option offense. And, and we were able to move the ball, I believe, for about, you know, 288 yards on the ground, which is um, really nice to see. Yeah, certainly. And then, obviously, you guys go up by six early in the third quarter. Unfortunately, there's an unsportsmanlike conduct call that backs up the extra point. PAT no good. I mean, that, those type of things, you know, they happen in football games, but in terms of, like, containing that excitement, what, what do you tell your players about, you know, dead ball fouls like that? Yeah, we address it because we talk about it all the time, and it's something that um, we addressed in our Sunday meeting yesterday. We celebrate with our teammates, and we make an emphasis of that. And, I mean, you know, it doesn't matter if it's one or six. Like, you know, Colby probably had four or five of those throughout the game, um, but it just affects you. You know, for us, we've been the least penalized team in the conference, and I've taken great pride in that. I think that's a cultural thing um, within our program where, you know, through four games we've run the ball, I couldn't even tell you, maybe 200 times, something around there, we have not one holding penalty. Um, you know, we had two penalties uh, on Saturday for 30 yards, um, but one that cost us. And, you know, I think it, that's all that matters. And when that, when that happens, it affects the game. And I think it's something where, again, it's growth, it's maturity, it's understanding situations, it's not letting it get um, – too big in the moment um but for us you know you know i think it's uh it's one part of it that didn't make or break the game it, it affected it obviously but just like you know a a, a miss block miss pass miss tackle a miss pass breakup all those things affect the game and then at the very end you score a touchdown two-point conversion attempt take us through that play uh colton was rolling right it was on the other side of the field so i couldn't really see it but take us through that play it looked like he had someone maybe but it got tipped yeah the dn made a great play i mean steve's wide open um, and you watch on the tape, and it's the, the left index finger of the DN running down the line that just tips it and deflects it, um, and that's just football. You know, sometimes it goes your way, sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, there's a lot of plays throughout that game that, you know, we felt we, we could have been in position to take control of that game. I was very happy with how we came out of halftime, and even just that first half, being able to feel like we were on our heels a bunch, but getting it to, to be tied up right before half take it into halftime, come out in the first drive, get a score. You know, I think that showed a lot of growth um, within our program. And, you know, in these rivalry games, and, and Colby's a good opponent. As I said last week, their 0-3 record is not indicative of how good they are. They are physical, big, experienced, a lot of seniors on that team. And that defense, you know, I was very proud with what we did up front against them. You know, uh, but, you know, the last play comes down to it. And then, you know, they made one more play than us. And, and that's what happens in football at times. And it's not... Um, a lot of positives from the game. It sucks to lose, especially a rival game. But, I mean, at 5 o'clock yesterday, you know, that was that was our time to, to, to grieve the loss. And now we're on to toughs. Um, 
but you know really proud of how our guys competed you know the effort was there the energy was there the belief was there um, and that just shows growth in our culture and our culture will always you know overcome any type of outcome win or loss I know obviously you guys I think you met on the field after the game what was your major message to the team afterwards yeah, it just it's tough in that moment. It's uh, the football gives you the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, and you know, and I think at, at times it's um, appreciating the opportunity to experience those emotions. Uh, I think you know a lot of people um, on the outside that maybe not have played, just watched, don't really understand the sport. You know, they can be Monday morning quarterbacks at times, and, and who cares? You know, what I'm saying, uh, you know, the, the opinions on the outside really don't bother us at all. Um, but for us, it's just being able to go through those emotions and appreciate the game and, and understand what it takes to, in order to become what we are going to become, um, you have to go through this. I say it to the guys all the time, uh, if you're afraid to lose, you're never going to win. You know, if you are afraid to, to get in there and put it out there and you don't understand it, you know, you're, you're never going to win. And, and for us, you know, we came off a big win the following week and I was, I was, I was uh, very happy and pleased with the energy and, and the attitude in that game. Um, and it was just one of those games. It was one of those games that you know, it came down to a couple of plays here or there, um, and we didn't make enough. But just told them that I love the group, and now we got to we got to regroup. You know, we got to regroup, overcome. Um, we've dealt with adversity before, and now we move on and we march forward, and we just got to get better. We got to keep getting better. Um, but again, we have a lot of younger guys out on that field that I, I was very impressed with how they handled that moment. Um, and when you look at it, I've talked about it a bunch. This is part of the process. We are building. Um, we are on the definitely on the right trajectory. We are definitely. Um, you know, going down the right path. And, and for me, I was very proud of the effort. And that's one of those things that if you can control that and that's a cultural aspect, then you're always going to have a chance to be successful. Tell us a little bit more about, they call themselves the Hogs, the offensive line. Um, you know, you have five guys who basically played every snap. I know that the center got hurt. So Eli Dawson came in, looks like he did really well. So tell us about this offensive line, what they've meant to the team so far, particularly with the run blocking. Yeah. You know, first and foremost, I was very impressed with Eli Dawson. It's a senior that, you know, hasn't had too much playing time. And as we talk about this, when your number's called, you got to be ready. And it can happen at any moment. So him coming in in that game and, and helping uh, replace Parati there, um, he did a great job and, and was a very big part of it. But up front, I mean, that's where we build our, our team. And that's where we'll continue to build our team offensively and defensively um, is, is in the trenches. Um, those guys, uh, you know, work really hard. And for, for me, when we switched over to this offense, I said to him, I was like, guys, you're the quarterbacks now. Like, we're going to ride you guys. You know what I'm saying? So uh, it, our offense moves. They're the legs of our offense. Um, you know, so for us, really, you know, starts with Big Pete, you know, Simplicio. And, and he's a senior, you know, fifth year. And he's played a ton of football. And he's been a great mentor because, you know, we have two freshmen and two sophomores next to him. And, and, you know, a lot of people always worry about that because O-line's a very tough position to play, you know, early on. But, I mean, you know, they, they've done a great job of just communicating and growing together. That room is so close. Coach Watchers has done a great job with them. Um, you know, and the scheme that Coach Thompson's put together has really put them in a position to succeed. And as you see it right now, it's, it's why we're, you know, second in the conference in rushing. It's, uh, you know, why we're able to produce a, a, these points that we've been able to do in the last couple of weeks. And then also – become competitive and that's really a big piece when you can run the football you can win football games um, and I'll stand on that so for us we just got to continue to develop it continue to move it but those guys have done a great job up front and they're only going to get better uh, within this system all right so Tufts is this Saturday uh, under the lights again so another night game um, Berluti their quarterback's been around since I don't know since forever so tell us about what we can expect to see from the Jumbos yeah uh, extremely talented team you know, uh, you know, took Trinity down to the wire in the fourth quarter. There, Trinity sort of pulled away late, um, but offensively, you know, Berluti is uh, very dynamic. You know, and and for us, you know, them watching the tape, they're going to say, hey, he could probably run the ball a bunch as, as the Colby quarterback did. So we got to contain him, but he can throw it, he can run it. Um, they have good skill positions, big up front, um, a variation of different uh, formations and motions and shifts and six alignment at times. So. We have our work cut out for us. It's a, it's a good team that's been at the top of the league, so it's another good test for us to find out, you know, where our resolve is, um, where we're at, you know, coming back, you know, from a, a big win to a tough, gritty loss. Now we're at home under the lights. You know, it, it's a good challenge for us. Again, I always say every week, challenge to see where our program's at in this development. Um, you know, defensively, you know, they do an odd, they're, they're, they're a different defense. It's very schematically not the same as anybody in our conference. Uh, a lot of man, a lot of different shifts, motions, and stunts, and things of that nature. So it's going to be a it's going to be a, a tough test. You know, they're they're a very good team. Um, they've consistently been a good team. A lot of respect for their coach, Coach Savetti, and 
um, and what they do over there. So it's going to be a, a tough one. All right, Coach. Thanks so much. No problem. Thank you. Junior Sergio Beltron was the breakout star of the Colby game for Bates, carrying the ball 11 times for 102 yards and a touchdown. It was an impressive performance, made even more impressive by the fact that Sergio Beltron, on paper, is a wide receiver. And he is our male Bobcat of the Week. Well, Sergio, I'm not sure what to call you now. You, you came here as a quarterback. You are a wide receiver last year. You're still listed as a wide receiver. But you had 102 rushing yards on Saturday against Colby. So take us through when the coaches kind of came to you and said, hey, we want you to start, you know, running the ball. Yeah, so we kind of knew this year we had a really great O-line. Um, so it was just finding ways to kind of get the ball into the open field and let the playmakers of our team make plays. And, uh, I mean, we ran the ball up the middle really well last week against Wesleyan. So uh, we kind of knew that to counter that, Colby was going to be looking for that inside run. So, you know, pitching it and getting the ball outside was going to work in our favor. And, yeah, I mean, Coach Thompson, our OC, did a great job scheming up Colby. And, yeah, we did a great job of running that triple. Are you practicing more with the running backs now? Are you still practicing with the receivers? How is that going for you in practice? I practice both ways. I think for our team, you kind of have to know and play every position. So if you're a receiver, you're going to have to know how to play a little running back. If you're a running back, you're going to have to know how to play a little receiver. So just being able to, like, rotate guys throughout the game so we have fresh legs and making sure everyone knows everything is really important for our offense. Yeah. And then you touched on the offensive line, but what was it like running behind those big hogs up front there? Yeah, no, it's it's super exciting when they just block everything up perfectly and all you can see is just green grass when you can't see – like a unblocked Colby defender, all you can see is green grass. That's the best feeling because that's when you can just, you know, burst with your speed and hit the grass, and that's all because of them, yeah. And then how are you building chemistry with both Colton and Seneca, not yeah. only on the pitch, catching the pitch, but also just on route running in general also? Yeah, I mean, both of those guys are great quarterbacks and also just great people to be around. So just knowing, like, who they are off the field helps build great chemistry, Uh also, just trust them trusting me and me trusting them. It all comes down to trust. So we know that we trust each other and that if we allow the other person to make a play, like they're going to make it. Like when I didn't get the ball and I got like a fake pitch, Seneca Colton would juke one or two Colby the play, players and like get a first down at least. They they did a great job running the ball too. And you shook a few guys yourself out noticing. So where did you get uh, those uh, uh, moves there? <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> Like, juking people was probably my favorite thing to do <laughs> when I played quarterback in high school. Like, throwing was fun, but when I scrambled and juked guys, that was that was the, the peak right there. That was really fun for me, yeah. Did you run option as a QB in high school? No, it was know. it was just more of a spread, but okay. I kind of treated it like option because I would run and scramble a lot. So I think that's where I kind of developed like, just – making people miss in those juke moves yeah how much does it help you having been a quarterback knowing kind of what Colton and Seneca are going through and and, and experiencing out there and and seeing yeah so I kind of understand that quarterback is kind of the hardest position to play in the field so they are kind of processing a lot of information out on the field so being able to kind of like be a check down or just an option for them whenever they need it is really important and just understanding where they're looking at certain plays and uh, like just the progression of the defense and where I have to be to be open for them is Something like that's really been helpful for me playing quarterback, yeah. And so now, technically, you're a wide receiver, junior. Mm-hmm. We've got some young guys who are contributing wide receiver this year. Yeah. Um, Vadu, Carver, uh, Gleason, a sophomore. What have you seen from them as, you know, you're now the, the wise upperclassman? Yeah, I think those guys just have a type of energy and just, like, dog in them that we haven't really seen before from freshmen especially. Uh, they're not scared to compete, and they're they're letting, like, the opposing team know too. Like, they – they have energy that kind of just manifests throughout the entire team. So when you see them make a play or make like a big block, it just gets the entire team riled up and ready to go. So they, they do a great job of being athletic, but also just bringing the energy to the team. Now yeah. for you personally, you missed the first two games because of injury. You kind of got eased back in a little bit against Wesley and, yeah. and then obviously big breakout game against Kobe. Mm-hmm. What's the process been like for you to come back from this injury and get back out on the field? And how tough is it? You know, you traveled to Amherst to, yeah. to watch the guys and not be able to get out there. Yeah, I mean – I think hindsight, it probably worked out best for me just because I got to see how talented like our freshmen and kind of just our position group as a whole is. So just knowing that like even in a in an unfortunate scenario when I get injured, I can like I know the team and I can trust that the guys around us are going to make it happen. So just seeing how like talented we are on the O-line, like offense in general and like the slots, receivers, running backs uh, kind of like gave me peace, I guess, when I was injured. But, you know, it was always exciting to kind of get back and feel healthy for, like, the first time in a while and 
just you know play and compete with my my teammates out there it was yeah that was amazing what position should we describe you as now <laughs> uh i think i think the technical term that i would <laughs> classify myself as is athlete so just yeah, yeah. um i don't know just being someone who can get the ball and yeah try to make a play is, is what i would classify myself as yeah, yeah get that ball in space uh, take us through the 40 plus yard run you had to set up uh the well, i think one of the early touchdowns right yeah uh it was a it was kind of a triple option play that we practice all the time but uh like this was the first time that I've con- gotten it and seen so much open space, especially because it was like my first real game back. Yeah. So as soon as I got that ball, I just look up and see green grass. Like all the Colby players had a Bates players on them blocking them. So all I had to do was just try to run as fast as I can straight forward. And uh, yeah, just being able to not really do much. Like I just really had to run. And I kind of give all the credit to like the receivers and online because we we really wanted like blocking and physicality to be a big goal for us this year and like i think we showed it against colby that we are even though we're a young team where you're physical and like we're ready to get out there and compete yeah yeah and obviously it was a very close game um you know tough two point loss but i mean the team as a whole what do you guys you know what do you guys talk about right after the game how are you guys feeling right here we're talking on a monday yeah i think i think as a team as a whole what we talked about after the game was that we're progressing like we're a developing team we're nowhere close to being as great as we want to be but we see like glimpses of our greatness and we saw it during that game uh I think in the past we would have kind of like when we I think Colby scored in the opening drive and like before we probably would have been down on ourselves kind of lost energy but I think us as a team saw that like we rallied and we kind of like came together as a team and decided to fight back and not give up throughout the entire game so just think those glimpses of like the culture changing in a positive way and also just the competition the guys have is something that we kind of highlighted in our meeting after the game and just like that we're ready to compete. So, you know, now we're past Colby and now we're prepping for Tufts and it's going to be an exciting game, yeah. And I feel like for the offense at least, having you back there in the backfield, I feel like that opens up a lot of different possibilities, right, in terms of the scheming. How excited are you to see what, what, you know, Coach Thompson and company come up with kind of as we go down the stretch here, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm super excited. Coach Thompson is, you know, one of – even though he's like a young OC, he is easily one of the most talented OCs in this conference. Uh, just like the amount of time and energy he places on his job, but also like checking in with us as players. Like we can tell that he cares about this a lot. So it's very excited to like, I'm very excited to see what like, he comes up with against Tufts, but I'm probably going to put my money on that. We're going to rely on our O-line to block really well and our receivers to block really well and get that run game going, which is going to open up that pass game. Yeah. So are you being asked to block a lot then when you're not getting the ball? Uh, I think, yeah. So whenever, like in our offense, whenever um, you don't get the ball, you're expected to block. Yeah. Uh, we That's kind of one of our periods in practice. Every practice is working on that technique and just physicality on blocking and, like, you know, understanding where the ball is going and where you have to block. So, yeah, it's like when we watch film, we watch the play and who gets the ball, of course, but we also harp on, like, who's blocking – where and like if they're doing it correctly like blocking is our our number one priority in our offense yeah and for you as a you know a smaller guy how do you kind of approach things with that yeah I think like for us as a whole often the receivers and like uh slots and running backs especially like even though we're smaller we just kind of have to understand like that mindset of like all right I'm gonna do everything in my power to just get in this guy's way and make him like just basically uncomfortable like make annoy him to our best ability just be like a pest basically so uh yeah just understanding like the technique of blocking so you can like fully utilize your weight even though like the defensive players may be bigger just just that mindset of like I'm gonna be here no matter what and like you're gonna have to deal with me all game is something that we yeah we prioritize. How would you compare your running style with uh, your teammate Ryan Linsky? Because, mm-hmm. you know, he showed he can cut to the outside also with a couple yeah. touchdown runs yeah. against Wesley. And so how do you guys kind of compare and contrast what you're bringing to the table there? Yeah, I think uh, Ryan Linsky, he's a lot stronger and bigger than I am. <laughs> so he has that on me. Uh, but I think we have very similar running styles. I mean, we kind of look for that open gap, uh, try to like go one way, make the guy, the defender think we're going one way, then cut the other way. I think we have very similar running styles, but I can say that he's uh, he is faster, stronger, <laughs> and bigger than me. But he's, he's faster? I think, okay. I think he's faster right now. Uh, yeah, I got I kind of got hawked down by a, play, a Colby player on that long run, so he has that on me, but he usually scores those long runs, and I got tackled, so he always has that on me. But, yeah, I think 
I think it's a compliment for me to say that we have similar running style. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, your thoughts on maybe that the Tufts game coming up and what you think? You know, it's only a Monday. But what do you think the you know, point of will be on in practice this week after such a close call? You're back home and under the lights though again. So I think we've kind of faced really tough defenses our first couple games. Yeah. So uh, you know, Tufts is a great team, but we've have gone against great defenses. So we just kind of got to stick to our, our identity and just do what we do. But uh. Yeah, I'm excited to also see what the defense is going to do. Tufts has a very great offense, and we have easily one of the best defenses, even though we're young. But I'm excited to let them do their thing and show everyone what they can do. Yeah. All right, home under the light, 6 o'clock, I believe, kickoff Saturday here at Garceland Field, Bates and Tufts. Sergio Beltran, running back, wide receiver, athlete, used to be a quarterback, block some people. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. The cross-country teams hosted the Bates Invitational on Saturday at Pineland Farms as the men's team finished in third place out of 10 schools, while the women won the event for the second straight year. And it was the second straight meet that saw senior Phoebe Pohl cross the finish line first, as she clocked in at 22 minutes, 31 seconds. We caught up with our female Bobcat of the Week right after the race. All right, Phoebe Pohl, the winner of the Bates Invitational here today, this morning at Pylon Farms. Phoebe, you're a senior. This is your final race at Pylon, so take us through what's meant to race here and how it went today. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I love Pineland. It's a lot of just like hilly trails in the woods. And I don't know, we started out as a group, um, just my like training group pack running together for about the first mile. And then things kind of strung out a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think it went well. It was a really fun race. It was competitive. So. <laughs> and you ended up running there. Um, you, were, you broke away from the pack. So when did that kind of happen throughout the course? After about a mile, it kind of broke apart. Um, but yeah, I had the... Like the lead cart was kind of in front of me the whole time, so that was helpful just to have that to chase. <laughs> and how about this? Your senior year, you win the main state meet and the Bates Invitational back to back meets. How does that feel? <laughs> Pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm psyched. <laughs> what were some of the people telling you when you got in here? Get the congratulations and everything. What was that like? Yeah, it was, I don't know. I have my grandparents here and my dad, so it's nice to see them after the race and all my teammates finish, obviously. So. Yeah, and Bates put on a pretty good show in here today. What's it say about your teammates? Uh, you know, have a bunch of people there in the top 10. Yeah, I think we're in great shape. I'm excited for, in two weekends, we have con, so I think it's gonna, we're going to be competitive against the other teams, and I'm excited. So. And lots of fans yeah. here. It's loud, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> What's it like? Know, we're cross country race. It's definitely loud. <laughs> yeah, what was the atmosphere kind of like as you ran? It was exciting, yeah. Um, we had a lot of the track team came to watch, which is really fun, um, and then just a lot of parents always come to support, so it's a great community. <laughs> All right, Phoebe Pohl, thanks so much. Congratulations. Thank you. The number 11 nationally ranked Bates field hockey team hit the road over the weekend, falling to number three Williams by a score of 2-1 to one on Saturday before picking up a big road win on Sunday at number 22 Hamilton as Bates prevailed 2-1. to one. The win leaves the Bobcats with a record of 7-3 and three overall and 4-2 and two in NASCAC play. They are tied with Tufts for third place in the conference and they take on the number six nationally ranked Jumbos this Saturday at noon. Junior Brooke maloney Kolenberg scored the eventual game-winning goal against the Continentals and she joins the Bobcast this week to talk all things Bates field hockey. So, Brooke, first of all, a big win at Hamilton on Sunday um, in NESCAC action. You scored the first goal pretty early on in the contest. Take us through that play and how it developed. I know first year Rose Gordon got the assist, right? Yeah, she did. Um, to my memory, it's kind of hard to remember sometimes after, but um, I'm pretty sure Sophie or Maria, someone sent it into the middle, and I was able to get a shot off that was blocked by the keeper. Um, the rebound came all the way back to Rose outside the circle, and she just sent a great ball in, which I was able to get a touch on, and it went right into the back of the goal. Yeah, you've been finding the back of the goal quite a few times now uh, so far this year. You're tied for the team lead with uh, four goals this season. You had four goals all of last year, so what's been opening up for you on the attack this season? Um, yeah, definitely exciting that I've already matched those same stats from last year. Um, I think just being low, being ready, and just going for after every ball. I think I was a little bit hesitant the past couple of years um, to get a touch on if I wasn't sure if it was coming to me, things like that. But really just having that like attacking mentality um, and going for everything has been really helpful. And also in the past, you came off the bench. You still played a lot, but you came off the bench. Now you're starting. So what's it like being a starter? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a little bit different, um, kind of setting, in, setting the pace for the team right off the bat. Um, whereas when you're coming off the bench, it's more like you're jumping into that same energy. So I think – just making sure I'm ready pregame of um, like starting with that high men good mentality of high intensity um, and keeping that going throughout the game. 
So Anna Cody was on last week, and she mentioned how after the Wesleyan game, um, the team basically just changed the strategy of how you approach things. And Anna actually moved to the outside. She was no longer in the inner. Did your role change at all, or did you stay pretty similar? Um, a little bit. We changed from three high forwards to just two. Mm. So I'm still a high forward, but instead of a more strategic like um, defen- defense on our press, we just like run really, really hard. So it's a lot more sprinting, mm. whereas last time it was a little bit more of like consistent running. But that's pretty much the only big change for our forwards because our job is to score. So that's <laughs> oh, it's pretty consistent. Yes, yeah, so you and Maria up front, basically, right? Yeah, Maria, Sophie, Emma, yep. Lucy, we all kind of sub in. Maria is more of like a recess center. Mm. Um, so she's kind of controlling the middle of the field right behind us. And then um, I'm on that top, too. Tell us a little about your background. Like when you start playing field hockey, what made Bates the place for you out of high school? Yeah, so my mom played in college at Middlebury. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so she was there. So she got us into it early. I started in second grade just in the backyard with my sister um, and my mom, like, having sticks because we didn't have a youth program until fourth or fifth grade. Um, I jumped into that. I started playing club in seventh grade, which is, like, the earliest you could really do it back then. And then I played club throughout high school um, and then also the high school team, obviously. And for Bates – my sister went here, so it was definitely a, a nice appeal seeing how much she loved it. And our recruiting process was during COVID, mm. um, so I was lucky enough to already know Danny really well through that. And I grow, grew up coming up to the games <laughs> um, in high school and, and seeing something really special that I wanted to be a part of. So I'm just glad it worked out. I was going to say, you've been part of this program that has reached new heights, kind of, like even from when you were watching games. So what's that kind of been like to be part of a team that's kind of you know made some history here? Yeah, it's really, really cool, Um, especially seeing the games from, like, three or four years ago before I even got here. Um, I play, like, a pickup league in the summer with a bunch of those players, Mm. and they always are like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you guys, like, took the program to new levels, and we're so excited, and they come back to watch us, which is really fun. So um, it's really nice that the, the past alums are also recognizing that. Yeah, so your mom went to Middlebury, huh? So is she looking forward to October 26th? <laughs> definitely, she is. She's definitely a Bobcat fan now, full through and through. Um, but, yeah, she always loves, especially when we play there, because she gets to go back and see all the buildings she was at. She takes us a to- uh, on a tour around campus, which is fun, too. Walks around and is like, oh, like, look, yeah. this is where I had dinner. And like, oh, yeah. this, is where, where, this is where my class was, the library. I'm like, Mom, we've been here, we know. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> That's it's funny. Fun. So, yeah, I mean, the team is... As a whole this year, I mean, the, the the changing of the strategy kind of midway through the season, what was that kind of like? To be like, hey, we're going to do something completely different. Definitely stressful. <laughs> um, we had one three-hour practice mm. uh, before our boating game to kind of work out any kinks or see if it was going to work. But kudos to the team. We really all bought into what was going to work. We knew Danny had a vision. We trusted her in that. And we were just really happy it worked out. It was definitely a shift, though. Um but it was a fun shift. It kind of brought that spark back into our playing that we were missing. Yeah, this past weekend was a NESCAC road weekend. I mean, you were at Williams at Hamilton. Um, the Williams game, it looked like, I mean, you were going toe-to-toe with them. Sophie had the late goal. Um, but, I mean, it was kind of a chance to see how you measured up to them a little bit, right? Yeah, for sure. It was definitely a good battle. Um, we were on their turf, which is a different surface sure. than right. what ours is, um, which is a good challenge. You know, we'll see anything in postseason. Um it was definitely a good battle. It just happened to not fall our way. We had um, both had one corner the whole game, right. each team, which is like unheard of. Really, really um, interesting stat there. So it's a good challenge. I'm excited to probably see them again in the postseason. The corners, because you are the one delivering the insert on the corners most of the time. Yes. So um, did you do that in high school and club, or was that new when you came to Bates? Um, I did it a little bit in high school my freshman year when one of our inserters got injured, but in high school, I was mostly like at the top of the circle, um, and in club, I kind of just did it all. So I had a little bit of experience, but not so much. And then um, I tried it out freshman year, and I love it on the AstroTurf because it's a lot easier, um, and it kind of just stuck. Yeah, on the AstroTurf, I imagine you just, you just rip it in, and it's nice and fast. Yes, definitely. <laughs> How's it changed when you're on like a field turf, like at Williams or something? Um, Williams is pretty flat, so it's easier to push in. But on like stickier surfaces, like Con College or even like our Garcelon. You just have to do like kind of a like a hit or a push pass in, so it's less consistent, um, but still makes it work. Gotcha. And look at the schedule coming up here. Um, we've got obviously a midweek home game against University of New England, who also beat Bowdoin this year, um, so they're a good non-conference opponent. And then Saturday will be a great showdown against Tufts. I know Danny Kogut used to coach there, and always a, a rivalry matchup. I feel like I knew you've done preseason scrimmages with them before. I know. So, what are you most looking forward to about the Tufts game this Saturday? 
Uh, I'm excited for the competitiveness of it. Um, I think our whole team gets really competitive, especially with Tufts. A bunch of us play there for pickup in the summer, so we know a bunch of the girls on the team. Um, one of our co-captains from high school that I played with is on their team, and we're really good friends, so it's always fun to go up against her. Um, and I'm excited for really high intensity, good battle. Well, yeah, what's it like when you when you know the other players like so well? Because sometimes, I mean, I'm sure other schools you don't know them at all. Yeah, it's honestly. We usually laugh on the field. Like, we'll just say something like, oh, like, that was such a bad call by the ref or something like that. Um, making it fun of the game, um, keeping it friendly while also being competitive, would say, is the biggest thing. Yeah, because, I mean, it's a pretty big game, right? It's basically yes. a battle for, like, the third seed in the mm-hmm. tournament a little bit. So, I mean, what's, what's going to be the key to success this weekend, do you think? I think playing really hard, really intense for all 60 minutes is going to be key. Um, and just doing our simple well, our simple passes, flats, throughs. Um, receive, shoot, stuff like that. Excellent. What are your thoughts you want to share on this past NESCAC weekend we haven't got to talk about yet? It's definitely a good weekend for us, especially a long trip out to Hamilton and, and Williams on the bus. It's never never easy, but I'm just really glad we were able to, to find one of the wins this weekend. The Bobcats beat Hamilton there on Sunday by a score of 2-1. to one. They are ranked 11th in the country heading into Wednesday's game, 6 o'clock against UNE, and then another home game noon Saturday against Tufts, Campus Avenue Field. Everyone should come out and support the Bobcats as they make another run towards the postseason. Thanks so much, Brooke. Thank you. The women's tennis team played their lone home match of the fall on Sunday and defeated Nichols College by a score of 5-2. to two. Sophomore Iris Westmoreland has moved up to number one singles this year, and she has a new partner at number one doubles. She won both her matches on Sunday and joins the Bobcats this week to update us on the women's tennis team. It was really exciting being back with the team. Um, it was our first home match, so everyone was pretty excited. We had some parents there, so that was exciting. Everyone performed really great. We were super pumped. Everyone went out hot. The doubles format changed, so we were a little apprehensive about that. But I think everyone did really well with it. Excellent. You and Olivia Gidlow were the number one doubles team. Um, how's that pairing working out and working with her? Yes, this was my first time playing mm-hmm. in an actual match with her, and it was actually really awesome. Um, she has really quick hands at the net, and I set her up with some pretty big serves, so she finished off lots of the points at the net, and it was really good. We went out on the court, started off hot, and we came out with a win 6-1, so it was great. Yeah, doubles now to six points instead of eight. How does that change things? Um, you definitely need to go out on the court ready, going out hot, energized, so I think that's exactly what we did. So we were a little nervous about that, but we did a great job with it. Now, and you're, you also play at number one singles, and you won the first set, but it was 7-6, lost the second set, and then dominated the third set. So what changed for you in the third set when it was down to the wire, you know, winner take all there? Um, yeah, it was definitely challenging playing a third set for the first tournament back. But um, I think the big difference between me and my opponent was I think I was a little bit more energized in the third set. Um, I kept my energy up, stayed up to date with electrolytes and eating between sets. So I think I just had a little bit more energy than her and I was just more focused. How much time did you have between your doubles match and your singles match? Um, I think like 10, 15 yeah. minutes, not too, <laughs> long, not too long, but doubles didn't last very long, so it wasn't a, much of a problem. Deepak Strammer, obviously our women's tennis head coach now, Paul Gassengay, focusing now on the men's team. What's it like to have a dedicated uh, women's head coach now? We do miss Coach Gassengay, but I think it is for the best that we have our own coach to support our program. Um, it's just nice having one person solely focused on our team. Like we've been doing a lot more fitness, a lot more focused drills for the women's team. And I think it's just been really great overall. He has a really great attitude at practice. Um, we've been a lot closer with him. So I think it's been an awesome change so far. Well, we still do miss Coach Gassengay, but he's still around. Yeah, he was there on Sunday. He right? was there yeah. this weekend on my court. <laughs> <laughs> so helping out still, obviously. Uh, you touched on that, but Deepak's personality, what's he like? He's very positive. Um, he's very uh, well-spoken. I think he's really used to coaching girls, it seems, so he knows how to come across. He's very uplifting. In my first tournament at Bowdoin, he was on my court the entire time, and he was really helpful, gave me some really awesome advice that helped me win my match overall against a girl from Colby. So I've had a really awesome experience with him so far, and I'm looking forward to the season of coming with him. Yeah, you're a sophomore now, so take us through you know, last year, your first year of college tennis. What do you learn from that experience you're going to apply to this season, you think? 
Um, last year, I think I definitely learned how to manage my nerves. Um, I really looked up to Allie Friedman, who was our number one singles player last year, and she just taught me different mechanisms of dealing with nerves before matches. And I think this year I've already started to apply them, and I've gone onto the court a lot more confident with matches under my belt. So it's been a great season so far. I think I saw Allie at your match on Sunday, right? Yeah, she was here. <laughs> we would like to have her back. That was awesome seeing her. We miss her a lot. Um, I have some pretty big shoes to fill, but <laughs> I'm up for the challenge. That was going to be my next question, right? Now you're moving to number one singles, so what are your thoughts on that kind of? Right. I'm really excited. Um, I had a really long summer full of tennis and fitness gearing up for the fall season and the spring season ahead, so I think I'm ready for it. And then now looking at the schedule for the women's tennis team, uh, you have a New England Women's Intercollegiate Tennis Tournament that's going to be at Amherst and Smith. Uh, that is this weekend, actually. And then that's your last term of the fall, right? You're, yes. Yeah, nothing else. So what are your thoughts on this one coming up? I mean, you said off air it's going to be probably similar to ITA New England, you think? Yes. I think it's going to be similar to our other ITA tournament that we had. Um, I think we're all ready for it. We've been really working hard in the weight room and on the court. We've been spending a lot of time together so I think we're all really excited I'm excited to play some more doubles with Liv and get out on the court and play some more singles and then after that you enter the the winter which Paul Gassingay calls the investment season right. so how are you going to use that winter time to prepare for your first spring match which will be in Florida on February 20th yep I think that we just need to continue keeping up with fitness and conditioning I think that's a major part I think that's a major improvement we've made this year we've um, we've been doing two 6.30 a.m. lifts during the week and then an additional workout over the weekend. So I think that really helped me in my match that I had a lot of endurance. So I think we need to keep up with that and then just continue practicing, hitting, playing matches, and just gaining more experience on the court. One thing um, I think you probably – well, I talked about this the last time you were on, but you're from New Orleans. Yes. <laughs> so how did Bates get on your radar? Because we don't get a ton of people from New Orleans. Right. Um, I went to a recruit camp and met Coach Gassigny and immediately loved him and came and visited and met the girls on the team. And I felt like we had a lot of similarities. And I really loved the tight-knit community of Bates and the high level of academics, which was something I was looking for. So I felt like it was a good fit for me. The weather is really different, but... <laughs> I'm still getting used to it. Well, New Orleans is hot. Right. Yeah, like yeah. real hot and humid. And did you play outdoors? Like, Yeah, it was all outdoors. <laughs> there was no indoors. But I think that actually helped my endurance because I'm used to playing in the heat, like long matches. So um, this weather is really nice. <laughs> I was going to say it must be must be a positive change. Yeah, definitely yeah. <laughs> a positive change. Excellent. And then um, just, yeah, any other thoughts you want to share about the team so far um, this fall? Obviously, you know, it's a young season, most of the season's in the spring. But anything else you wanted to mention we haven't got to talk about? Um, I think just this year, this is the team the closest has ever been. We've just been working. I think we this is also the hardest we've, we've ever worked. Coach um, Deepak has really been pushing us to the limits. We've been really working on conditioning, like I said. And I think everyone's just fitness levels have really improved, and I think it'll really start to show off in the spring, as it is now in the fall season already. I was going to say that conditioning will help you win those three-set matches, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Iris Westmoreland, the number one player for the singles and doubles with Olivia Gidlow for the Bates women's tennis team. They were 5-2 to two winners Sunday over at Nichols College, 1-0 now on the year, a tournament coming up this weekend at Amherst and Smith. Uh, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. While the soccer and volleyball teams fell on the road this past weekend, they get a chance to bounce back this week with women's soccer having a big home match against rival Bowdoin on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And everyone's hosting toughs on Saturday except for volleyball as Emily Hayes' squad heads to Connecticut for their matches against Connecticut College and Trinity this weekend. Find the complete schedule online at GoBatesBobcats.com. And we'll catch you next time on the Bates Bobcast. Bobcast.